Freight trains running on the branch line? Surely not. Hi, welcome back to Chatham Model Railway. I'm Charlie and this is part two of the Branch Line Station build. If you hadn't seen part one, it's video number 194 and hopefully there should be a link up here which will bring you up to date. Now in the last video I did mention that I was open to suggestions for modifying the track plan before I start nailing track down on the boards and boy did I get some suggestions. But first, let's have a little recap on where the current plan stands. Now coming off the main tracks, there is this uh, siding here, off, coming off this double slip, which makes its way up into the goods area. And the first thing we go past is a catch point just there. Then we have a short straight piece of track followed by a long left hand point. Now moving on a little bit further, you can see I've just laid another left hand point over the top there, um, which will fit later on. And then we go back up into the main area, um, which I went through last week, which is basically um, two parallel sidings, um, one of which goes alongside a proposed platform area and another siding going around to the right hand side, which we'll go into later. Now it may seem odd that this train has come into a siding which isn't alongside the platform. And that's because arrival and departure sidings tend not to be alongside a working area. The trains are dismantled or built outside of the working environment, as it were. Now, as you can see, because of the point configuration here with a runaround, that on arrival, the class 25 would detach from its van it would run down the other side of the point, the points would change and the class 25 would then go through this set of points and then depart either off to a head shunt or back to the TMD. Now the next thing that we need to do before we break this train up and address its cargo requirements is we need to remove the guards van and so you would bring in a shunter, take out the guards van and put the guards van in a dedicated place, such as a guards van siding, or somewhere where it doesn't impact on the rest of the movements. Now in this case, at the other end of that head shunt is an ideal place for us to stow our guards van. Now hopefully you follow a channel that I'm involved with, it's called McKinley Railway. And down at McKinley on the, on the south coast, they move their freight trains around in something known as triplets. So as you can see, there's, there's three conflats and three vans at either end of this train. So when we come to shunt, we don't actually break the vans down completely, but we move them in groups of three because if you, if you were to move them all individually, let's be perfectly honest, it would be a tedious operation. But we must bring in a sort of shunting with purpose. You've got to build into your layout some operational uh, movements that actually make it all sort of worthwhile. There's no point just bringing it in and move a van and move it back again and you think, what's the point of that? You've got to make it an enjoyable evolution. So we move in triplets to take away some of the arduous movements and just make it more enjoyable. So now the shunter is free to break up this train and put the relevant vans into the relevant sidings. Now this is where my cunning plan starts to fall apart because the length of three vans plus this shunter is around about 40 centimetres or 15 and three quarter inches long. Now, having collected the first three vans, our shunter brings them up through this long left-hand point and we need to clear this point. But now, of course, as you can see, we've now gone through the catch point and we're now impinging on the main lines. So clearly, this is not a feasible track plan. Now, I think we all know what the answer is. And that's, of course, to install a head shunt in this area. So we need another left-hand 
point and we need a piece of track. But how long does this piece of track need to be? Well, if we go to 66 centimetres, which I think is 26 inches, then from the end of this point here out to here will give us the shunter and two triplets. So it then opens up the shunting abilities much better. So that's where my, my thoughts are going to be. So I need to install that piece of track and that point. Uh, this point is sort of fine, but it's actually this one is actually going to take the place of this one, and this one will go in there for some strange reason. It's actually because this tortoise point motor underneath here won't need to move. Um, we obviously need to install a point here to give us the line that one runs around the outside of the station. And furthermore, if I install a right hand point here, and then it will give me another line going out here to a separate industry on this board. So that's what I've got to do in this area is one, two, three, uh, four points, and then I can get down to the other end. Talking of the other end, things have certainly changed in this area too. Because in the previous video I mentioned I was very short of space to allow um, housing and uh, road and car parks to feed the station because of this distance is so small. But then it kind of dawned on me that actually I've got another sort of, um, what's that, 14 inches here then that I could use and as if by magic I could always slot in an extension piece. So on here I could put the, the housing, the infrastructure and the roadways with no cables because there's no track here, perhaps the odd building, building lighting, that sort of thing, and if necessary install a small back scene up to about here. So that way it gives me the flexibility then, as I have shown here, to pull the station back and suddenly with my three car DMU the station looks um, considerably longer. I mean I could even pull it back even further so you could get a high mech and three Mark I coaches in. You could obviously get the high mech off, you have to pull another loco on the other end to take the train away, but it does give you more sort of operational uh, scenarios let's say. So that's kind of where I am here. Um, I, I like this, this extension piece. Um, I want it to be removable so that when I'm sort of filming, obviously for the channel, I can sort of show more involvement. So um, I'm not going to bury my head in the sand about this isn't crucial, but it certainly opens up the playability, you know, the operational uh, usefulness of this layout. And just to emphasize that, I, I mentioned in the last video about more than one person, you know, using the layout and the guy over the TMD would send a loco over um, to hook up to a van train or from another freight yard would send in a small freight train and this freight train would go to that freight yard. So you have a chance to work with friends on the layout and um, it's not just a one man evolution. Obviously train controller runs the scenic trains. So these trains here, the sort of small passenger trains might just come and go because they'd be computer driven. Whereas people would operate the trains and make it the interesting layout that I, I hope it will become. So there we go. Gosh, that was a mouthful. What have I got to do now? Well, over the next few days for this video, um, take these boards down, get rid of all this stuff open up the helix, be able to get into there, get underneath those boards there and install those four points and that head shunt. Some of the point motors will go underneath, the tortoise point motors, and some, because of the restricted space underneath, I will have to use surface mounted point motors, which are the MP5s that I've used before. The MP5s are currently out of stock, but I can just run the, the point rodding for those, so I can put that in and then await for them when they come back in. So that's my sort of focus, um, which we wish me luck over the next couple of days while we get stuck amongst this then. Now I've swung the left hand long point around 180 degrees. The trouble is um, it didn't quite fit, so I had to mark up and remove some of that catch point. But please note at the bottom in the centre is the actuating arm from the tortoise point motor, of which operated the same point when it was in the previous position. So in we go with a mighty Dremel and remove a couple of millimetres off the edge of those rails. And 
I can see now the actuating arm coming through the switch rail of the point. And then once I've removed the fish plates, we can see that actually it's a pretty nifty fit. Now sadly I'd made a small hillside here with sculptor mould and there's nothing like a bit of brute force and ignorance to try and make up uh, for an area error of my ways let's say. So a bit of, uh, a bit of physical exertion um, will have that sorted. Now I found an old pot of Mod Podge and rather using um, my, my favourite glue uh, um, I went to use this instead. So rather than uh, waste my copy decks, I thought I'd just use the end of this pot to uh, secure this woodland scenic track bed down. And as you can see by this other small segment, it's obviously been recovered uh, from a previous um, mistake, let's say. So whack some more glue on there and then pop it into place. Lovely. And then popping in the piece of track to do a, a little uh, test and you see where I need to drill the holes through for the cables both for track power and also I'll need uh, a hole for the uh, illuminated buffer stop at the far end. So then we go for a quick trial fit. Looking good and if you notice some of the uh, sleepers have been removed at the bottom end of that track and that's to allow for the um, movement of the switch rail on that catch point. So when I lay the track down in a second you can see those missing sleepers. So once it's in place the normal case of uh, um, a dollop of books and uh, that will sit there until that uh, copy decks has gone off. Can't have enough weights can we? Now I returned later on last night actually to trim a bit more of this sculptor mould away as you can see by the change of t-shirt. And the sculptor mould I must confess is a great deal harder than I originally thought. So I've gone for a little modelling saw this time to try to make a, a neater job of it. but. Unsurprisingly that wasn't necessarily the best way and we're back to a chisel with brute force and ignorance. And of course if you can't get it off with uh, reasonable force then clearly you need more. Fortunately once you kind of get underneath it it seems to come off in slabs. Um, but hey, we, uh, we, we get there in the end don't we. As you can see by the arrow I've cut out a small section of the sculptor mold and this is to allow the MP5 surface mounted point motor to go in and there's a small groove cut there as well which will allow the actuating arm to come up underneath the, uh, the point through the hole in the switch rail. Now it's the following day and I decided to cover the boards with uh, three millimeter cork. As you can see the second piece is now weighted down and I've put bubble wrap between the cork and the books because I've used neat PVA and it tends to ooze through uh, the cork and the last thing you want to do is glue all your decent books down. So hence I use the bubble wrap and then after an hour or so I remove the books and the bubble wrap and the PVA dries out more naturally.
Well, now we're back in real time and this area here is pretty much complete as far as I can progress it. Here is the head shunt, that uh, long left hand, a medium left hand, the next medium left hand with these two cutaways here for the MP5s when they arrive and with their little grooves in there to, um, to put the actuating arms. And then we come to this last point here, the medium right. Now I do have access underneath here to fit a tortoise point motor and I mentioned in a previous video this little gizmo. Now made by 3D scale model printing and there should be a link to their Facebook page in the show more tab, they make these little 3D printed templates for various uh, points and double slips. And all you do is, it's what it's all about, is these four holes. You put this in place and then with a sort of a 1.5mm to 2.5mm drill, drill through those holes into the baseboard right through and that will give you your alignment holes for your tortoise point motor or the various ones that they make. So the thing now is obviously to fit this in place and hopefully I can do this without blocking your view. So it fits in there snugly. I can see the, um, the, act, the hole in the actuating arm through this hole. So all I need to do now is drill through those points there, four holes, which will allow me to um, line up the tortoise point motor underneath. Um, and it will line up perfectly so there's no um, sort of guesswork involved. Ought to be easier. Now time for a catch up. The head shunt is in and connected and the block detection sort of stuff is sorted. This is point three which was around the other way and I've now switched that one in and that's been reconfigured and works perfectly. Points 12, 11 and 10 are all fitted and wired. However, as I mentioned, I don't have the MP5s for points 12 and 11, but the cabling is all installed going back to the um, stationary decoders. That's all sorted, whereas point 10 is in sorted with the tortoise point motor underneath and that works perfectly. OK, let's take a look at the other end. Well, I've loosely fitted in the inner board and as you can see, I've painted the cork a dark grey colour just to take the shine from it. And in the fullness of time, if the ballast or whatever gets chipped, it's not quite obvious when you see the, the glaring light brown of the cork. Taking consideration I've got this extra panel to put on here if I need to, then I brought the station back. I can now easily get a three car uh, DMU or a four car for that matter um, onto either of these two platforms but it's the freight side that takes the thinking. Now, there's our class 25 in front of the three triplets and I have enough room here for it to come down into this little head shunt um, with enough room for the buffer stop here and then to get it to run through those points and away. So it's a case now of marking out these two points and fitting those and the rest of the track, as it were, will sort itself out. Now I've always been an advocate for building boards in sections that are removable should you ever decide to move house or that the attic's too cold to go to anymore or the double garage doesn't work or the kids have left home and you can have one of their bedrooms. So um, I tend to build the boards as a modular unit and then you know should that sort of situation arise it's not the end of the world. So on with this one then I pulled it back from the from the uh, wall and I've marked out the basics of where the track should go and of course I need to fit these points first because then it's a case of joining the points up to the lines on the main board and it all should sort of come together. Um, so I, all I do now is I draw my holes from my cables, drop my cables through, then sort of uh, fit the point motors and then once this is all down then run the tracks uh, in each direction and join up with the main board. So, I'd better get on with it. One problem I have had with these cables is you, they're so long, 
you've got to be very cautious that you don't stand on them because they're obviously going straight to the floor here Now hopefully this should obviously line up, which it doesn't, for some strange reason, the uh, frog wire is in the wrong place. Okay. That seems in and seems all, uh, all well, so now I need to mark out the holes where the two um, armatures would come up from underneath. Now what I use is two small um, track pins with the heads cut off and I just pop those into the holes Then carefully take the points back out again and there's the two holes that we required for the 10 mil drill. Now before we go any further, I want to keep these uh, points in place and to that end I use the Pico uh, track screws, that's P-I-K-O, you need to search for those. These are marvellous, I don't want to glue these ones down uh, currently, I'll secure them with these screws and then come the day of the race with the ballasting, once the ballasting is done I'll take the screws back out. So then it's simply a case of refitting the guide plate from Scenic 3D, like so, and then drilling those four holes again. Now having wired both of these uh, switch machines up, I'd like to share with you a little gem. Now, I'd like you to remember at this stage that the top of this board is the front and the bottom of the board is the back. So as we zoom into this tortoise point motor, if we look at the colours, the blue at the bottom and the yellow at the top switch the point itself. The next three down, which is the sort of purple, pink and brown, there, that's a feedback uh, facility. But the next one down is the green, that's the frog. Beneath that is the red and black. Now, I wire my layout generally black to the back and similarly, the black cable here is towards the back of this switch machine. So the bottom of this board is the, goes to the back and it goes to the wall and the red is to the front. Now, if we zoom in on the other one, we can see exactly the same applies here. There's the red cable, which is at the front of the board, and then the black, and then the, uh, the tortoise point, then the, the frog cable. So it's black to the back, and therefore the frog should be wired up with the correct polarity when it changes. Now it's fair to say that I've tormented you enough in the past regarding wiring, but it is worth saying that um, I've now dropped some uh, drop us through and if we just take a look at these two here which should be at the bottom there is A and D for the arrivals and departures and the top one there is goods one so as you can see we're starting to shape up with the droppers coming through but I think now before we go any further it's time for a test 
So here we go for a quick test. So we shall bring up our little class 25 with its three triplets and hopefully it should rise up here as it normally would and then divert through the double slip and start to come down the goods line through point three and then it hits point 12. And point 12 hasn't got a point motor so I've jammed it open with what we would normally call in the trade a Mark I cocktail stick. Progressing past point 12, it should then divert and then come down what we have known as the arrivals and departures line and then come up towards the other end and then stop just before it hits these points. I'll disconnect it, drive it through the points into the little head chunk there, change the points, bring it all the way back and then after another bit of cocktail sticks and stick it in the top head shunt and we know everything works. Ha! That's the plan. That is clearly isn't going to be the fastest loco move. Because I'm filming and I'm trying to control this at the same time. And this is where we may hit our first snag with the cocktail stick. No, nope, the pickups are good enough to get over the frog that's obviously dead. Sorry for the jerky movements. As we head down the other end and let's stop it here. Now I shall uncouple it quite discreetly. Now hopefully I can just run it across this point and into that little head shunt without going off the edge of the board. Reverse the loco and then change the point with a smoke alarm battery. Beautiful. She runs up to the other end. Oop. <laughs> Bit of a snag here. Bear with me. I found the problem, and this is a problem with using second hand or used track, there's an insulated fish plate there, we have cut it in the past, so once we cross that, she's away. So now let's follow her on her way, through these points with a bit of luck. and then off into the new head shunt. Lovely. And then coming back over to have another closer look at that fish plate, where is it? There it is. I've obviously used it in the past as an isolator. So clearly I need to sort out this piece of track because this piece is dead. And if I can put a meter on it, and hopefully you can see there that we have power. And then crossing here, nothing. Power there, nothing there. An easy snag to sort out. We are at last clearly making progress. Back in this area, there's still room for development, let's say. And I had contemplating moving those two um, platform lines off to an angle just to sort of break up the sort of parallel regimented feel of it. Of course I would lose some of the area then over by the houses that I suggested but then this area here opens up to perhaps more of a, a disused railway feel. 
At this point, I'd like to thank both Ed and Lee because they both talked me out of putting a double slip where point three is. And as you can see, it would fit perfectly. But in all truth, I mean, you wouldn't put a double slip on an approach to a small goods area. It's far too complicated. Um, even though I have a love for double slips, they, they sort of, st <laughs> they ridiculed me until I gave up. Not quite true. Ed came up with a very interesting situa uh, suggestion. That's about this siding here and about fitting a ramp. Now, please excuse me using a Hornby platform ramp to show you what I mean. But what, I'm, so what, what Ed suggested was, um, even though we use this as a sort of um, an area for dumping a guards van, you could also use it for <laughs> vehicular loading, which would make kind of perfect sense, really. And of course, you're not just limited to conflats. We could use sort of bolsters and uh, and load up with vehicle types there. I think going a stage further might be a stage too far that this would be a motor rail uh, area because it just isn't big enough, the infrastructure isn't here. And besides that, how would you get your trains back in to unload all your motor rail vehicles once the folks are, say, coming back from the seaside? But I do like the ramp idea, and now you can see why that uh, this track is shorter than the rest. Which brings me on to these two tracks, and this one is a reasonably wide gap now because I'm thinking of having a triangular um, depot area um, all the way through here to unload um, both this track and this track into this area, and then we can dispatch by road. And then finally this track over here, this would actually be inside a building and whether I put another small siding outside, but that would be a standalone um, industry. Something like a, a biscuit manufacturer or something like that would go over in this area here. Now, besides help from Ed and Lee, I had numerous emails coming in with pictures and diagrams and any rail files showing me you know, ways that other people had perceived this area to develop. And I'm extremely grateful to you. And I'm sorry, but there are too many to name. But, but please, please understand that I am most grateful. One other thing I mentioned was about using tablets on train controller. And people mentioned, yes, there's something called smartwatch. Sadly, I can't use smartwatch because I'm on train controller gold version nine, and they only sell smartwatch now with version 10. I'd asked the manufacturer, he declined. Um, so the only way I can use smartwatch, unless you know otherwise, of course, is to upgrade, upgrade to version gold, version 10 gold, and then buy smartwatch version 10. Bit of a palaver, and it's needless to say more money. Dreadful. But unless you know a way around it, then um, you know, please let me know. Right, that just about wraps this one up. If you have any advice for me, then please leave it in the comments section. And please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. In the meantime, as usual, I'd like to thank my patrons for making it all possible. The subscribers, and if you're not one, there's the button. And remember, subscribing is free. And there's a video here and here. And I'll see you in two weeks' time. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.